In popular culture, we've all seen countless images of the Satan, and usually we see him ruling the fires of hell from the underworld. We see pitchforks and horns. But what does the Bible actually say about the Satan? What does it say about his location and his tactics? What does it say about his crew, the fallen angels and the demonic entities? Well, it's time to explore in detail what the Bible says about all of this and more. Stay tuned. Whenever one decides to grow in their knowledge of God, one of the first things we have to do is read the Bible for ourselves. You see, we all have been bombarded with inaccurate and fanciful ideas when it comes to spiritual concepts. For instance, many of us grew up with this idea that God is some giant with a long beard who sits on a cloud somewhere. And such ideas make it harder to believe in God. But when you actually read the Bible for yourself, we see that it says God is spirit, which is actually a very practical concept. Many of us grew up with the idea that Satan is a red horned figure who lives underground. But when you read the Bible, we are shown what and where Satan really is. And when you get deep into it, again, you will find a very practical concept. Now, many of you have seen our previous episode, which tells the story of this gangster who goes to hell. And in that presentation, it shows this image of Satan with horns, and it seems as if he is the ruler of hell. And so here, I just want to make the point that the imagery there is not to be taken literally as how Satan actually works, because this portion of that episode is symbolic to show how Satan is largely responsible for those who end up in hell. So in that episode, the images are mostly figurative and often symbolic. However, in our most recent episode, where we expose one of Satan's lies, the imagery there can be taken as more likely how Satan works and where he is. So is Satan ruling hell from under the ground? Well, let's just jump right into what the Bible says. So here, Ephesians 6, 12, Paul is writing to the Ephesian church and look what he says about Satan and the forces of darkness. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, the cosmic powers over this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So here Paul, um, when he's writing to believers, he says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, meaning humans. He's saying that our main enemy, Satan, is where? In the heavenly places. We wrestle against the authorities, the cosmic powers who rule the kingdom of darkness, the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Now, when we look at the Greek word for heavenly places here, let's go to tools. We end up finding the Greek word heavenly places. And that is the Greek word epirenius. And in the Greek, we see that epirenius is often used to translate the heavenly in heaven, um, celestial basically something that is existing in the heavens. And so let's go a little bit deeper than that by clicking here to see how heaven in the Bible is described. And the Greek word, of course, there shows that heaven in the New Testament refers to what? 
in the air, the heavens, really in the skies, the universe, the aerial skies or the universe. So here we see that Paul identifies the location of Satan, uh, the forces of darkness, the Satan, um, not underground ruling, but actually ruling where? In the heavenly places, which we have just seen in the Greek, refers to the universe, the skies, the airs, basically above us, not below. And if you study and research the ancient Israelite tradition, you will find numerous writings that refer to the Satan and the forces of darkness existing in the heavens or in the celestial regions. In fact, according to Israelite tradition, there was once a time when Satan and the angels who he convinced to turn against God were banished from God's presence. And when those rogue angels left the high heaven where God was, they weren't immediately thrown into hell. No, they were actually allowed to roam around the universe, to roam around the heavens with Satan. Interestingly, the book of Jude in the New Testament actually quotes from an ancient Israelite document that was well known around the time of Jesus, the book of Enoch. Many of you are well familiar with the book of Enoch, and so I'm sure you probably know that most Christian scholars uh, don't really view it as scripture, but do recognize it as an ancient Israelite historical document that highlights what many ancient Israelites believed. And in the book of Enoch, there are quite a few interesting narratives there. One of those narratives tells the story of how many years ago, long, long time ago, the group of angels who chose to side with Satan committed a great sin. These fallen angels were known as the Watchers. And one thing that they watched were how pretty women were on earth. And in fact, some of these Watchers or fallen angels decided to marry and even mate with human women, which was a great, great sin in the eyes of God. And according to this narrative, Whenever an angelic being and a human mate and produce a child, the result will be a Nephilim. What is a Nephilim? A creature that was never supposed to exist. A diabolical integration of the angelic with human flesh. A walking abomination. Now, this could all just be a great story and very creative. However, Genesis 6 says this. Look at what it says in Genesis chapter 6. It shows us one of the main reasons why God sent the flood upon the earth. So here it says that when human beings began to increase in number on the earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of humans were beautiful, and they married any of them as they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit will not contend or uh, will not remain in humans forever, for they are mortal, and their days will be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days. And also afterward, when the sons of God went to the daughters of humans and had children by them, and they were the heroes of old, men of renown. So here we see um, in this story, it's talking about what happened right leading up to the flood. And it's showing that the sons of God here saw the daughters of human beings and they were attracted to them and they decided to marry them. And they had children by the daughters of humans. And the product of that were these Nephilim. And then here it says that they were uh, the heroes, who is it referring to? Most scholars would say that this is referring to the Nephilim. Back in those days were the heroes. They were great, great creatures of strength. And we see in verse six, it says that this really disturbed God. And it says that the Lord regretted that he had even made human beings on the earth. His heart was deeply troubled. But we know that God did find favor with Noah and his family. 
And so therefore, Noah and his family were saved in the ark. God then sent the flood and basically wiped out all of humanity and these Nephilim creatures, um, which in his eyes were just a huge abomination. They were never, ever supposed to exist. So ultimately, we see here that one of the reasons why the flood came is because the sons of God impregnated humans and produced these hybrid Nephilim creatures. Now, just like any biblical passage, there's always going to be various interpretations. Uh, some scholars say that the sons of God here may refer to a different race of humans. However, it seems that the majority of modern scholars and more importantly, ancient scholars view the sons of God here as referring to angelic beings. Why is that? Well, Remember the story of Job. Job was a righteous man and he had favor with God. And so Satan wanted to test Job's faith and harm him. But in order for Satan to do that, he had to first ask God for permission. Look at how it reads, Job 1.6. It says that the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan came with them. So here in this scene, we see that the angels, they came before God and Satan also came with them and then began to ask God if he could attack Job. So the interesting thing here is that these angelic beings are being referred to as the sons of God. And so that's one reason why some scholars would say that the sons of God in Genesis 6 refers to angelic spiritual beings and specifically in Genesis 6 the fallen angels who chose to follow Satan. Now again according to ancient Jewish literature found among the Dead Sea Scrolls such as the book of Enoch the fallen angels who chose to impregnate human women were immediately punished by God and were chained and placed in prison in the darkest region of hell for doing that and they were placed in a region of hell called Tartarus. And so it's quite an interesting narrative. And so the question we have to ask ourselves is, is there anything in the Bible that says that the angels who sinned with these women were chained up and placed in Tartarus? Is there anything in the Bible that mentions that? Well, actually, the apostle Peter alludes to something similar in one of his letters. Look at how it reads in uh, 2 Peter 2, 4. So here Peter is uh, talking about the judgment of God. And, and here he says regarding the angels, he says, God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them in chains of darkness to be held for judgment, but sent them to hell. Now, I always say that whenever you come across the word hell in either the New Testament or the Old Testament, because of modern translations, you really have to investigate the Greek and Hebrew word that was translated into the English word hell. And one of the reasons is because the word hell is translated from many different words. In the New Testament, it's translated from the word Hades. Sometimes you'll see the word hell translated from the word Gehenna. Sometimes it is translated from the word Totaro. And these are three different things. And so we want to look here to see what is the Greek word behind this translation of hell. And to do so, we're just going to go to tools here. And we see that it says that if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell. And the Greek word used there is Tataro. What is Tataro? The deepest abyss of hell. Tataro refers to the deepest abyss of of Hades, of Hades. In the Greek, it is often uh, referred to as the abode of the wicked dead. And so being the deepest abyss of Hades, we see that Totaro is not just Hades. It's not just hell. Totaro is the darkest 
probably the most painful region of Hades. And that's where the angels who sinned were chained and sent to the Greek word to Taurus held there for judgment day. So pretty, pretty scary stuff. And so when it says that they were placed there um, to await judgment day in chains, some scholars note that perhaps the great sin that they committed was when they saw the daughters of humans and married them and then produced these Nephilim. And so those who have a literal reading of the Genesis 6 account will likely say that yes, some of these fallen angels committed a sin that allowed them to be placed in chains of darkness until judgment day. But what about the other fallen angels who are not locked up in Tartarus? Where are they at? We know that Satan is not locked up yet because we know that he and his crew were still able to approach God and ask God for permission to attack Job. Satan was seen in the heavens with the sons of God. And that was after the Genesis 6 account. So it seems as if Satan and his crew are still around. Now, one could say, and some do say this, one could say that perhaps when Jesus ascended to heaven, Satan was then locked away and uh, chained up at that point. Some have made that point. And I understand that. However, you still do have theologians who would counter that and argue that, well, even after Christ ascended, the Apostle Paul still said that Satan and the powers of darkness are where? In heavenly places. And so seemingly, even after the ascension of Christ, Paul is saying that we still war against cosmic powers and high places in the heavenlies. That seems to indicate that Satan and his crew have not yet been locked up in chains in the abyss. In fact, I just thought of something. We know that during the thousand year reign, that's when Satan is locked up into the abyss. It's likely that then he will be locked up into the same abyss that the fallen angels were locked into for sinning with women. Just thought of that. Um, but anyways, so it seems that he is not locked up yet. Right. So is there anything else in the Bible that talks about if Satan is locked up yet or if he's still out there roaming around? Well, John, in the book of Revelation, he seems to indicate that Satan and his fallen angels are roaming in the universe. He seems to kind of indicate that. And he kind of alludes to such an idea in Revelation 12. In the book of Revelation, chapter 12, it describes a battle that will take place between the good and evil angels. And in this battle, Satan will end up losing his place in heaven or in the universe and will eventually be thrown down to the earth. Look at what it reads in Revelation 12, 7. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. So here we see that Satan and his fallen angel crew were strong enough to even fight Michael, the archangel, and the good angels. But they were not strong enough. Look what it reads in the next verse. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. Verse 9, and then the great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. And as you read along here, you will see that after he is hurled to the earth, then it talks about how the Antichrist will begin to rule with the help of Satan. The beast will then rise. And so this is a very, very interesting passage here. Of course, as with all passages, there are many different interpretations and scholarly opinions on it. Some people believe that this battle between the angels of light and the angels of darkness has already happened. Uh, some people believe it happened very recently. Um, but again, you do have scholars who say that it hasn't happened yet because we see in the passage that after Satan 
is defeated in this battle against the angels of light. And after Satan is thrown to the earth and loses his place in the heavenly realms, that then the Antichrist rises. And so by that logic, I do understand how some can argue that it seems as if this battle is something that will happen in the near future, right before the Antichrist starts to rule. And that might be a reason why it says that once Satan is thrown to the earth, it says he is filled with fury because he knows his time is short. And so this verse seems to indicate that the moment he is thrown down to the earth realm, that that will be in the end times, because as it says, his time is short. And then soon after that, we see the rising of the beast and the Antichrist. And so um, what are your views on that? You know, do you see Revelation 12, the angelic battle there as a future event? Or maybe you see it as symbolic, you know, so there there are many perspectives with that. But again, it does fit into the argument showing that Satan is not underground. The fallen angels are not underground. They are and always have been roaming the heavens, roaming the universe. This makes things a little bit more serious because this means that we live in a world that is currently under the control of satanic forces and angelic beings who are above us. And if that is the case, that gives us a huge clue into how Satan operates. You see, it is not coincidence that we live in a world that looks at Satan as some type of creature underground. That's what he wants us to believe. That is part of the deception. You see, as long as we are looking down, we will fail to look up. He doesn't want us to look up. Because if we glance towards the sky, what will we see? Air, the atmosphere. <laughs> well, why is that important? Oh, it's vitally important. You see, in the air, what is traveling? Radio waves, television signals, communication devices, the entertainment networks. Every day, millions of invisible signals are traveling all around us. The air and the atmosphere is the highway of our technological world. And who controls that highway? Well, let's look at what the Bible says. Ephesians 2, 1. And as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. Here, clearly it shows that Satan is the ruler of the kingdom of the air. In the King James Version, it says that Satan is the prince of the power of the air. My friends, whoever controls the airwaves controls the radio waves, the TV signals, the communication channels. As long as Satan is above us, it is easy and practical to understand why his influence is so strong in our world. He is in control of the media. And not only that, but did you know that we now have technology that can transmit ideas and emotions into individuals based upon the signals that we transmit to them through the air? So if we as humans have reached a point in our mechanical achievement that we can do such things, how much more could Satan and his fallen angels with far more advanced technology do the same? Now we clearly see how the Satan influences our world. And so I would argue that even while he is in his remote location, he can still easily remotely control much of what's going on in our world. Now, I know some of you have some ideas about 
the type of technology that is now existing and possibly the type of technology that Satan may have at his disposal. So, you know, if you are one who has done extensive research on this, please share in the comments your findings as well. Now, as you could imagine, with any discussion of Satan and fallen angels existing and seemingly being able to roam around the universe, this will inevitably bring up a big question. An AOC network is far from a conspiracy channel, but the question can't really be avoided. What about all of the unidentified sightings of objects that people report? Are they all fabricated? Or is it possible that some of these sightings are manifestations of fallen angels? alone in the universe. A UFO in the form of a bright light is seen descending over the dome of the rock in Jerusalem. The video is said to be taken over the weekend. Uh, another video from a different angle. Whoa! <laughs> U.S. Senators received a classified briefing about UFOs at the Pentagon. You may have heard that pilots and other military personnel have been reporting these, these kinds of sightings for years. A couple weeks ago, the Department of Defense even released footage shot by a Navy Super Hornet pilot. Senator Mark Warner, who is the vice chair of the Intelligence Committee, said, look, I think it's important. He told us just this afternoon, I think it's important that the military is taking this more seriously now than they did in the past. So what are they taking seriously? Those videos you were talking about, where these pilots were describing seeing these things up to 30,000 feet in the air, flying at extraordinary speeds, hypersonic, well over the speed of sound, changing direction in the most uh, astonishing ways, and seemingly defying the laws of physics. I know you think that the government didn't take the threat seriously enough, so, so let me just ask you point blank the question, do you believe that that life from somewhere else, while you ran this program, came here, visited, observed. I will tell you unequivocally that that through the observation, scientific methodologies that were applied to, to look at this phenomena, that these aircraft, we'll call them aircraft, are displaying characteristics that are not currently within the U.S. inventory, nor in any foreign inventory that, that we are aware of. So I know you're using, uh, you're being clear, but I mean, the answer is yes. Um, my personal, I can't speak on behalf of the government. Obviously, I'm, I'm not in the U.S. government anymore. My personal belief is that uh, there is very compelling evidence that we, uh, we may not be alone, whatever that means. Now, if we are going to talk about this, we must first consider something very very important. We must consider what exactly fallen angels are. We know that fallen angels were at one point angelic beings who were on God's side. And scripture shows that angelic beings have a special type of body, a spiritual body. What is a spiritual body? A spiritual body is a type of body that can not only exist in the physical world, but can also interact with the spiritual world. We talked about this in the How You Will Look in Heaven episode, and in that episode, we explored the scriptures that speak on how Jesus was resurrected in the spiritual body that one day we all will have. And that same body is very similar to the type of bodies that angels have. It's a body that can literally exist in two different realms at once. Basically, this type of body could go through physical objects and then become physical again. When Jesus was resurrected, he was able to do this. At one point, 
He walked through a locked door and then occupied physical space again and ate fish. And he was not hindered by anything. He was not hindered by space or time. And so the spiritual body is incredible. And so the question that we really have to ponder at this point is, do fallen angels still have that spiritual body that angels possess? Or were they stripped of that body after they left God? Hmm, something to think about. Share in the comments what you think about that. I do think that you could make the argument that when those angels chose to leave God, maybe they lost some of their power and beauty. In fact, there are many who argue that evil possessed them and that they changed somehow to something much more sinister. And so, yes, you could make that argument, but I would still say that I lean towards fallen angels, not just being spirits, but still having a spiritual body in some capacity. And one reason for that leaning is because in Revelation 12, it says that they were in a battle with the holy angels. They lost eventually, but they were still able to put up a fight. And so that indicates that they still must have some type of a supernatural body to even be able to go to war with God's angels of light. Now, what about demons? Often people do confuse fallen angels for demons. And that's understandable. I mean, we don't really talk about this sort of thing in this level of detail in our churches very often, um, which is why we're doing it now. Uh, but actually, fallen angels are very different from demons. Demons are only described in the Bible as evil spirits. Nowhere are they shown to be physical creatures. They are always described as spirits who really aren't even that powerful. In fact, they are often always shown to be looking for someone to possess because they are just spirits who don't really have power. In fact, that's why they are always trying to possess humans because they need a human body in order to function and operate in the physical world again. And so demons are really just spirits. They, they can't really manipulate physical things without a host. So they really aren't that powerful and they definitely couldn't fight with angels. They are just spirits. So where do demons come from? Well, Again, if you look into ancient Israelite theology, the primary idea of where demons come from is the aftermath of the flood. Remember the, uh, the Nephilim? Well, many scholars argue that it is likely that when the flood killed those hybrid creatures, their spirits are now what roam the earth as demons. And of course, there are many ancient Israelite writings and Dead Sea Scroll documents that refer to this, such as the Book of Enoch, uh, the Book of Jubilees. And so, you know, it gets pretty interesting and it is an important study because if demons are just the spirits of Nephilim, we can see why if there are unidentified objects above us, it is most likely that they aren't demons, but actually fallen angels because fallen angels have that angelic body. And the angelic body is really described as an interdimensional type of existence. For example, if you had an interdimensional body, you would not have to even travel at light speed to get to a far place in the universe. If you had an interdimensional body, you would be able to move in and out of dimensions and even through portals to traverse the universe and even beyond. And so it's really above our level of understanding. I mean, we are really talking highly advanced angelic stuff here. Um, but nevertheless, it is great to research. And as always, you know, we are interested in your thoughts on this. So please share in the comments. Do you think that it is likely that these sightings are actually fallen angels making appearances and moving around to observe and manipulate our world? Or do you think it's something else, you know? So something to think about. Now, I know 
someone out there is thinking, wait a second, wait a second. You mean to tell me that there are evil beings out there flying around who may have advanced technology and power and they are roaming above us? What's to stop them from coming down and hurting me or doing something else? <laughs> well, good question. But you know what's holding them back? The power of God. Let's back up for a second. You remember Job? He was a friend of God. And Satan and his fallen angels, they wanted to hurt Job. And even though they were more advanced than Job, they could not harm a hair on his head until Satan first asked God for permission. That is huge. This means that Satan does not have ultimate autonomy. He can't just do what he wants. He can only do what God allows him to do. And if God allows him to do something, it's always for an infinitely wise purpose that goes beyond our present understanding. Now, Job was just a friend of God and Satan had to ask for permission to harm him. But you, you are a blood bought child of God. So listen, when you understand who you are in Christ, you start to realize why a fallen angel does not want to come to your house. Listen, some of you out there need to start realizing that you have authority in Christ. First of all, you have power in the name of Jesus. Get out of my house and stay away from my family. And second of all, God's angels watch over you. Did you know that? Read Acts 12, 15, Hebrews 13, 2, Matthew 18, 10. You have angels who watch over you. And when you use the name of Jesus, they are dispatched. In Jesus name. You thought this video was just going to talk about fallen angels and Satan. No, this episode is not only to expose their location, but also to expose their weakness. When you are a child of God, there is not a fallen angel. There is not a demon. There is nothing that can come against you. Some of you have been in fear. Some of you have been worried about the satanic world. But my friend, let it not be. If you feel that a demon or an evil spirit is around you, if you know Jesus, it's time to use your authority and command it to leave. Get out and go to hell in the name of Jesus. If you know God and have a relationship with God, my friend, the last thing a demon should do is come in your direction. They feared Paul, they feared Jesus, and if you know God, they will fear you too. And fallen angels? <laughs> well, they fear the name of Jesus as well. But you know what else fallen angels fear? Being thrown into prison like the ones who sinned back in Noah's day were. They fear being thrown to the deepest abyss of hell. So even a fallen angel would not want to mess with you because the last thing you do is mess with a child of God. So basically, when your dad is the king of the universe, you can not fear. So I uh, just wanted to wrap it up with that truth because I know that this has been an interesting topic, but the most important thing that I could say about fallen angels and demons and any of that is that you have power over them all with the name of Jesus. And speaking of power, you don't want to miss the next episode because we're going to be looking at the power of the first Christians. And just like how the Holy Spirit used them, I believe he's going to use you. Get ready. God bless.
Thank you.